Right. Good afternoon, everyone, from the Institute of Risk Management in London. Welcome to this webinar on the subject of supply chain risk management. My name is Carolyn Williams, and I'm the Director of Corporate Relations here at the IRM. We've got over 100 people registered to join this webinar today from countries all around the world. So welcome, and I hope you all find it interesting and useful. First of all, we've got some housekeeping issues to deal with. If you have sound problems, then I'm afraid it's likely to be a problem with the speed of the internet connection at your end, and there isn't anything we can do here in real time to help you. However, if you do have to give up, then you will be able to access the recording of the webinar after it finishes, so you can catch up later. If you have any questions as, you, as we go along, then please type them into the question box, and we'll see how many we can deal with in the time we have available at the end of the presentation. So, let's turn to the subject at hand, supply chain risk management. Understanding and managing the risks surrounding supply chains has never been more important. As well as the traditional operating and financial risks, organizations are also facing challenges in relation to sustainability, ethics, geopolitics, and digital disruption of business models. We see in the news every day stories about trade wars, slavery, working conditions, contamination, fake products, carbon footprints, and natural disasters. Of course, at the same time, there are great opportunities. A robust supply chain is a great competitive advantage. New technology, including systems based on blockchain technology, offer opportunities for increased security and decreased transaction costs. You don't need to be working in a global organization to be concerned about supply chain. All organizations have a supply chain. Indeed, all organizations operate within a wider environment that an IRM paper a few years ago termed the extended enterprise. The point being that you cannot manage risk in isolation just for your own organization. You have to think about suppliers, 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 customers, regulators, neighbors, and other stakeholders. So, this is the agenda for today. Our first speaker, setting the scene in respect of modern supply chain risk management, is Nick Wildgoose. Nick is a qualified accountant and a supply chain professional and has held senior positions in a number of industry sectors, working for companies such as PwC, BOC Group, the Virgin Group, and Zurich Insurance Group. He has served on the board of the Chartered Institute of Purchasing and Supply and is a specialist advisor to the World Economic Forum on the subject, sub topic of systemic supply chain risk. Today, he works as a specialist consultant in the area of supply chain risk management. Then, our second presenter, joining us from the USA, is Bob Trent. At IRM's London Risk Leaders Conference back in November, we were very pleased to have a keynote address from Bob, who is Program Director and Professor of Supply Chain Management at the Lehigh University in Pennsylvania, USA. He also has practical experience in industry issues from his time working at Chrysler. I thought that Bob's address, which looks at issues of trust in supply chains, deserved a wider audience, and hence this webinar today. Then, if we have time, we're going to take any questions that you have submitted. And I'm first, I'm going to hand over to Nick Wildgoose. Hi, Nick. All right. Hi. Welcome to IRM. Thank you um, very much. Please, let us have your views on supply chain. Hi, Carolyn. Hi, everybody out there. I won't, you know, Good morning, good afternoon, and even good evening mm -hmm. to some people on the call. Uh, thank you for your time, first of all. In summary, I'm going to cover three key points. One is about the importance of having top management support in order to drive forward supply chain resilience, if I can call it that. Um, and in order to do that, how do you produce a compelling return on investment for supply chain resilience if you don't already have one? My second message about the importance of having a comprehensive supply chain risk assessment approach and Carolyn already alluded to the many risks that you face out there in your supply chain. And thirdly, I'm going to make the case, hopefully, for the need nowadays to have technology and good data to be able to, to allow you to make actionable decisions, you know, using data, basically. Um, moving on then to the next slide, please. Um, what I'm showing you now is just 
some of the results of what I believe is an excellent piece of work, um, which is a supply chain resilience report for 2019. I think before we make any steps in supply chain risk management, it's good to understand what the picture is out there. And this is one of the most widely quoted um, research reports. It's been going for around 11 years. And what you're seeing now is the very latest data. I've been had the pleasure of working with the BCI on this for those 11 years, um, and we've developed it over that time. Important for you to know, it's a free resource. Um, I think that always goes down well with anybody. And so I would encourage you to look at it, particularly in the context of a return on investment model, because it gives you um, some sound fitting, footings for that. And what we're seeing here, I mean, in one way you could say, oh, there's some good news, because actually the level of disruptions fell slightly in 2019. But if I tell you that 2% of the participants, and this is in another chart, had experienced losses in excess of $100 million cumulatively in 2019, you realize that this can be a significant cost to business. And as you're probably all aware, that in the typical business, you will find 50 to 80% of their costs are in their supply chain. So getting this right can be you know, compelling to top management. The other aspect I'd like to pull out here, if you're not aware of this already, is the amount of disruptions that actually occur at below tier one. Uh, most companies tend to focus their resilience efforts on tier one, which is very worthy. Um, but you, know, you need to also, as Carolyn pointed out, look below tier one at your tier twos and threes. And this shows that just under half of the disruptions reported in 2019 came from the lower tiers in your supply chain. So particularly for critical supply chains, and I'll come on to that more later, you need to look at your multi-tier exposure. And I'm sure Bob will talk, talk about that in the second half as well. Next slide, please. So this second slide, and, and as I say, I'm not going to go through all the report today. It would take a whole presentation. But just picking out here and just making you aware of the top five uh, causes of disruption in 2019. I think the interesting thing to note here is that um, cyber risk is a, is a significant issue, an unplanned IT outage and so on, and also that adverse weather is up there, going back to Carolyn's point around climate change, and we'll come on to that more later in the presentation. The other aspect to look at if you may say fantastic, or maybe you'll be very concerned that your competitors are already using technology, because the picture seems to show uh, over 40%, as you can see, of companies are using technology already in supply chain risk management. But fear not, in one sense, because I'm afraid to say that, although it's extremely good for Microsoft and I'm a great user of their products, 73% of those respondents are actually using Excel as their major tool. And I have to say, I'm somewhat puzzled how you can do uh, cover multi geographical locations um, across multiple risks uh, using Excel. But if somebody can explain that to me, I'd be very pleased to hear from them. Okay, so that hopefully gives you just a bit of a backdrop on the status of supply chain risk management. Moving on to the next slide, please, Karen. As you can see, um, the picture you face in terms of um, risk is a complicated one. It can come from all kinds of directions. It can come from tweets out there in the geopolitical environment. As you know, that's um, been a particular challenge for many of you on this call. Um, I would also point out the increasing interconnected nature of some of these risks. So, for example, um, one of the drivers in Syria for the geopolitical issues that have happened in that country was actually originally driven by a drought. So that just illustrates in an area of that country that then led to famine, which then led to, uh, among, you know, drove uh, the political unrest. So it's important you take account of those. And also, if you look at um, 2011, which was a big turning point, I would say, 
in the drive to supply chain resilience. Um, the tsunami had a number of ongoing impacts in various other areas. And just to put this in context again, the economic losses were $360 billion, it's been estimated, from the tsunami. And a large percentage of those were to do with supply chain and the economic losses from those. And for, for the risk managers on the call, you may also be interested, but also perhaps aware already, that there's a move from asset losses out there to value flow losses, so business interruption losses from a failure in a supply chain. And I think that's a, a, a trend that is only going to continue and reinforces the need for you to drive the supply chain resilience agenda and support your procurement and finance colleagues in this area. Okay, next slide, please. As promised at the start, one of the topics I was going to cover was supply chain risk assessment. Uh, you know, why do you do this? I think the first point I want to say, you know, where do, and my most common question I get asked is, Nick, where do you start this exercise? Because I will emphasize it's a journey. You don't go from A to Z in one step. You go one step at a time, as it were, like any other good journey. And the place I would suggest that you've started, if you're not already on this journey, is with your most profitable product or service. So where, you know, where do you want to protect the most? Where will you get the attention of top management? And if you tell them that your most profitable product, maybe it's 20% of your profitability, is at risk from a supplier, for example, in a NAT cap risk area or financially, then that will get their attention. And then having established the key suppliers, start to quantify the risks within this risk assessment and then facilitate the, the actions that are needed in terms of risk mitigation or transfer to move the, the task forward. Just to give you an, on the next slide, please. So. That's giving you a background on what we're looking to do in the risk assessment. Um, looking at the supply chain complexity, and I think it's important you realize that this is the case. I wish it was as simple as just having a basic supply chain and thinking about the physical goods. But as we've seen more and more in the recent past with things like the NotPetya virus, which hit, for example, the NHS, supply chains are not just about the flow of goods, or services, they require information and financial flows to operate successfully. And perhaps most importantly, as I touched on at the start, they need the people to be correctly aligned, and that can only come from your top management and encouraging them to line up people's objectives correctly. And in reality, supply chains are networks. By the way, the, the NHS WannaCry virus cost £90 million, it was estimated, which is a very sad state of affairs. Moving on to the next slide. And I, I apologize for this slide because you're going to say, as my readers often do, there's a lot on this slide. It's deliberately done um, to go with more than three boxes just to get across the message to you that you need to be comprehensive. And you'll be delighted, I'm sure, with Bob's presentation in the second half here that's going to go into a lot more detail on financial appraisal and the relationships importance between suppliers and customers. So I'm not going to cover that off in any detail. I'll leave that to Bob. But you need to be have a holistic view of supply chain and supplier exposure. So it's all very well doing great financial assessment, but as I said earlier, what if you haven't even looked at the NAT-CAT exposure, so the flood risk, particularly with climate change, of your critical supplier site? What if you haven't considered their labor practices, particularly given the importance, not just now a days of disruption risk, but also of the impact on brand value of a supplier failure or supplier issue, if I call it that? And it's also very important to understand not just the supplier aspects, 
but also the industry aspects. So hopefully I've given you a, a taster of that. And down at the bottom, it also talks about understanding what your critical suppliers are doing in terms of their supply chain risk management with, in turn, their suppliers. So this gives you a kind of framework. We're happy at the RM to talk with you more about this, and um, we'll give you advice in this area, and there'll be more about that towards the end of the presentation. Just to give you some illustrations now and to bring it to life, because it's all very well talking about the theory, but I've been lucky enough to work with a number of companies on the practice, so let's move on to the next slide. And I'm just going to illustrate it with three quick um, examples. Uh, firstly, the multi-tier, um, and this was working with a client way back in 2008 around the financial crisis, where by doing a, this comprehensive risk assessment and looking below tier one, we were able to warn them, yes, their tier one supply was fine, but that a couple of their key suppliers at tier two for their most profitable product were in severe financial trouble and about to go out of business. And of course, they will be able to react to that very pleased to hear about it and take the relevant mitigation action. The port strike issue, and this will bring me on to later in my presentation around near real-time alerting. This was some work with a large automotive company whereby because we were monitoring their supply chain, we were able to tell them that you do realize that a key port um, that feeds this particular production plant is due to have a strike next week. Don't you think you ought to shift your logistics? Otherwise, you're going to have a production shutdown. And finally, um, and this was, I think as risk managers, you'll find this quite amusing, and this is the expense of my procurement colleagues. Um, they'd done a wonderful job, they thought, of dual sourcing the supplies, which was excellent, you know, the ultimate backup. They had two lots of capacity. But in, in their wisdom, procurement, as you know, and I'm guilty of that, don't like to spend much money. So they thought, ah, oh, it would be a smart idea to put them in the same geographical region, and in fact, in the same country. So they were both in Mexico. So we did point out that though it was dual source, there were a number of dangers in that. I know it seems crazy to say that. You as risk professionals would never do that, but I'm afraid this is where you need to sit down with your procurement colleagues and you can help them. Okay, moving on. So I know you're all eager to learn about the technology or just give some insights into it. So this is just showing you what some of the companies out there are already doing. So they are monitoring. They have mapped out the supply chain just to show you what this picture looks like. This is taken from a demonstration solution, um, but each of these represents nodes in a supply chain network. They're getting incidents fed through to them based on criteria and rules that they've set. And just to bring this right up to date, um, I'm going to give you some alerts from today. I hope this doesn't panic any of you and you immediately leave the call. Um, so please stay with us for another half an hour. But um, So this one you'll probably all know about, wherever you are in the world, but the, uh, the French are on strike again today. You can't see this in the, the picture clearly. I haven't got the date. The, the slides are not as up to date as my facts are today. Um, but they're also threatening more logistics strikes at the moment. I think it's just the airports. Also, you might be interested to know that China has moved to a yellow and even orange alert in some territories, and that can lead to some production uh, facilities, particularly chemicals and things like that, being shut down because of pollution concerns. Uh, and I guarantee that many of you on this call have at least second, third tier suppliers that are in China. That's something you may want to watch. And finally, getting very specific about this, if any of you rely on aluminium, I'm afraid uh, this is an all too regular event. An aluminium smelter in uh, Seoul in Korea caught light this morning. So um, if any of you are dealing in that, watch out. Moving on. So that's all very well having the near real-time alerting once you've mapped out your supply chain. Uh, but it's also useful to look, um, you know, we're talking about that's agility when an incident's happened or might be about to happen. But you can also look at risk exposure. And what this chart shows you is just a place within China, but it's looking there at the, the current risk exposure. So what we're showing here is an ability for software vendors now to pull together 
the data about NAPCAT risk we talked about earlier, because you might be thinking, goodness, our procurement team are going to say they've got no time to check that out. But it's putting together that source with geopolitical data, with sustainability data, as Carolyn talked about earlier, and other risk factors into one picture, which you can quickly access when you're considering new suppliers or just reviewing your current supplier base. I'll come on more to that in a moment. So just giving you a few screenshots. Moving on to the next slide to give you just one final picture of this and talk a little bit more about technology. So this is summarizing those actionable risk insights. And if I just take the, the central chart there, and I think that's probably the one, the most interesting one, which looks at and you'll all be familiar with this in risk management. I'm sure you've read all of our textbooks um, and other publications that excellently come out from the RM. But it's a simple impact and risk picture of the supplier base, a typical supplier base. So the top right-hand corner are those suppliers that you may want to action most quickly. Because as I said earlier, it's all about actionable risk insights. So this helps you focus on the right uh, players. Uh, and, uh, and I just want to talk about other software that's coming along out of this. So digital twins is a, a jargon that's used at the moment. Clearly, once you've built an electronic supply chain like this, you can play around with scenarios. Social media monitoring um, is becoming more and more prevalent. I haven't got time to show you that. But you can track your suppliers across millions of local and social media sources nowadays in many languages to check what they're up to in terms of it can be commercial activity but also in child labor and sustainability issues and there's a, a fair amount of noise at the moment but that is being reduced to become more and more relevant and is more and more important in protecting a brand from a regulatory and compliance point of view next slide please and this is my final slide before I hand across to Bob. Um, and I thought it would be useful, and I promised as well, in getting your top management commitment, some of the headings that you might want to consider in terms of building out a return on investment model. And hopefully this gives you some insights. Um, typically, in, when I work with clients, I look at building out a three-year model. And if you just look at say, one potential disruption. It doesn't have to be that significant to your most profitable product um, in that three-year period. You will find just with that alone, it can be a compelling argument. But also, I, I see companies talking about the staff savings of a more efficient a risk management technology across the different teams. And having just one platform that you can share between the risk management team, finance, procurement operations to give you a view of what your supply chain looks like and having that common view of what the risk looks like can be really, really valuable. So I hope, just to summarize, I've given you some help on the top management side in terms of comprehensive risk assessment and an insight, a brief insight into the kind of technologies out there. And at that point, I will hand across to Bob to pick up on mm -hmm. financial myopia. Great. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, I'd like to see if um, anybody has any questions for Nick, then just type them in, into the box and uh, we'll come back and we'll have a, a discussion of any questions that are raised later. Uh, so thank you for that uh, theme setting that shows us the, the things that we should be looking at in a supply chain risk management today. Um, now we're going to hand over to Bob. Can you hear us, Bob? I can, and I have to tell you, I'm getting a, a 20 Three second lag when Nick changes the slide before I see it. So oh, what I'm going to ask, what I'm going to ask Carolyn, if you can go to the first slide and I'm keep going. Away. Yeah. And then, okay. and then I'm going to ask you when you switch the slide, if what the title of the slide is. I have them in front of me. If you haven't changed the order, then I'm okay. But it's gotcha. taking about 20 seconds to to uh, come in. So all you have to do, Bob, is tell me 23 seconds before you finish saying <laughs> what you want to say. And then well, we well my, my, my concern is that people at your end are seeing it right away when you switch the slide, and, and not everybody lags like I am. So if you could bring up, uh, okay, that's a good one. Why don't we keep going? Um, and tell me what's on the next slide. Is it the uh, 
What is financial myopia we have here? Okay, good. All right, we'll start there. Okay, good. Well, good afternoon. Again, I apologize for any technical issues, I guess, that uh, never fails when you're doing a webinar on risk, right? There's always risk, uh, but we'll have to be flexible. So we're going to talk about um, financial myopia. And that's a term that some of you may have heard and some of you may use, but it's one of those terms that gets defined different ways. So I'm going to define it uh, very specifically in the context of a customer-supplier relationship. So when I look at what is financial myopia, I'm really looking at the inability to comprehend, anticipate, or be concerned, really what's going on in the long term when I take short-term actions. Okay, and so in those cases, it may be things like a lack of imagination, foresight, or intellectual insight. I'm going to focus a bit with some data on the whole topic of extending payable terms and what that's doing and why when suppliers retaliate, it's actually a predicted and actually fairly um, a rational response. So financial myopia. And uh, next slide, please. I think the next slide, uh, Carolyn, was examples. It is. The next is examples of financial myopia. Sure. I got it. Okay. So one of the things, and one thing I want to stress is these examples are anecdotal. And you can always uh, uh, pick which ones you want. But the thing is, I have no problem finding anecdotal examples of how when customers take unilateral actions, how it circles back and affects the suppliers and they retaliate or they take action. So here's an example of a um, company that you know, pays in 90 days or more and it uh, still takes the discount that's offered. Another company that's actually local to where I'm at uh, now assigns an employee specifically to quantify the cost to the supplier of the extended payable period and then try to build that in to the price. And we'll talk about that or the unit cost of the good, how that can affect the customer's financials adversely. That's coming up in a second. Um, and then also this company says we're being more selective about who we will do business with. And we'll talk about that issue as a form of retaliation. And then the bottom one is the one I like, a friend of mine, he just says, I'm dealing with a customer so bad I fired him. And, you know, when the customer couldn't find a replacement, came back to the supplier, but the supplier says, you know, it's a business on our terms not yours. And believe me, they took advantage of that situation with the customer. So that's anecdotal. Later we will um, bring some data. I, I, I saw a quote from uh, W. Edwards Deming, who was a big quality uh, uh, guru in the United States years ago. But he said, uh, a person without data is just somebody with an opinion. So we'll try to bring some data into this. Uh, next slide, please. I have some feedback from someone watching who says they can see the slide straight away, so we'll have to okay. keep it for everybody here. So as long as I know what – we're going to talk about some important points That's about financial, financial mobile. Yeah. Uh, one of the things is I'm not trying to blame any particular groups, but I think I'm going to at this point. I, I think I probably will look that way. Procurement and finance have been particularly um, interesting in this area. You know, procurement – may do things like a unilaterally reduce invoice amounts, or years ago they would use reverse Internet auctions, um, you know, uh, or customers would, I'm sorry, customers would reduce invoices and use Internet auctions, reverse on just about anything, even when it didn't qualify. Um, and so what we have here, and, and we have some technical with the slides came over, that little circle down there should be over DPO. Okay, we had some yeah. transitional issues, but that's okay. Um, and finance, of course, with the extended payables, which is becoming almost uh, the norm today in, in most industries. But one thing that's driving a lot of this financial myopia is a, uh, the cash conversion cycle. Now, I've had a paper that came out called The Folly of Financial Myopia. If anybody's interested and you send me an email, I'll certainly forward you a PDF. And it gets a lot more detail into the cash conversion cycle and how to calculate suppliers are calculating cost adders, how they are determining the financial charge to them when payments periods are extended by customers, and how they might want to build that in on a per unit basis. And so it's kind of interesting as we go. So when you look at the cash conversion cycle, uh, lower is better. And, you know, it's days inventory outstanding plus days sales outstanding or receivables minus days payable. Now, I, I wanted to circle the payable. What's happening is obviously when we extend our payables, that day that figure goes up, and that's a good thing here 
because we want cash conversion cycle to be lower. That measures how quickly inputs are converted into uh, cash. So a study was done by Hackett Group, and it found that 100% of the improvement in the cash conversion cycle over the last five years has been due to extending payables, not managing receivables or inventory better. And so the actions can be myopic when they cycle back. Next slide, please. Okay, I'd just say about the slides, we, we have a little issue with them in that they were prepared in landscape um, widescreen format. Ah, uh, sure. And, and the sure. webinar software seems to be squashing them into that, standard that, That's okay. But we will, what we'll do, we we'll will survive. A, and we'll attach a full set of the slides to the um, webinar record so that people can download a whole set of, of the slides that look where, how they're supposed to look. So we'll do that. Right. So I apologize for that. Now, some important points about financial myopia. Okay, so next point on, on some important points is expecting suppliers to retaliate is predictable cost uh, according to something called reciprocity theory. And reciprocity theory kind of says if you're nice to me, I'll be nice to you, and I might even be nicer. Conversely, if you're bad to me, I may not be real good to you, and I might even be badder. So, you know, when we see the suppliers retaliating, when customers are unilaterally taking actions that affect their financial standing, it's really, you know, the customer is operating in what we call self-interest mode, and the supplier is not. So they're going to operate in reciprocity. Um, the other thing is about preferential treatment, and that will be a focus as we move forward in the next few minutes. Uh, the original studies that I'm going to look at, we did, we're really trying to understand uh, how to get preferential treatment from suppliers if you're a customer. And, and so a lot of the other findings we have came out of that. Um, and so what we'll talk about is, is, you know, what kind of preferential treatment and why you may or may not get it from a, from a supplier. That's really a very sought-after uh, benefit that companies should look for, whether they know it or not. Uh, next slide, please. And I assume the next slide is five ways, right? Five ways? That's correct, that, yes. Sure. So, so here's, the, here's the kind of the... Uh, just of the discussion is how does this financial myopia increase corporate risk? Well, interestingly, there's a lot of ways it does. And the first one is clearly financial. And, you know, if you think about a supplier trying to increase its unit cost or price to a customer, that can affect cost of goods or cost of revenue, however you measure it, which obviously can have a negative effect on your uh, gross profit. Also, it can drive up, and that's an income statement item, it can drive up your balance sheet on your asset side and current assets by increasing the value of inventory. Now, you might think that's a good thing because it's a current asset, but when you calculate return on assets, which essentially is income over assets, one way to look at it, when you potentially uh, decrease the numerator, and increase the denominator, return on assets goes down. In fact, I'm working on a paper right now, and we're modeling. I'm modeling the uh, uh, return on asset model, doing some what-if scenarios, and uh, using a very simple spreadsheet. If anybody's interested wants that spreadsheet, you can plug in numbers, and you can you know, kind of manipulate the numbers and see what will be the effect on a company's return on assets. So we clearly have that. The other thing is a negative impact on supplier and buyer trust. And we know that uh, is going to be a big, big issue, uh, and I'm going to talk about that in a moment, okay? Uh, next slide, please. We, we've talked about supplier retaliation, and, you know, the examples I gave earlier were all retaliatory uh, in some fashion. The other risk is something that, and Nick will talk about, you know, when he talks about disruptions, we don't track this kind of disruption, but it could be that the supplier just determines, uh, determines I'm not going to serve this customer anymore. And now, it may not be as drastic as saying you're fired. It could be subtle. It could be a supplier politely saying, we are choosing to no longer bid on your contract, uh, we're choosing to exit an industry or a segment, but whatever it may be, that does create corporate risk if the company does not have a, an adequate backup plan and many times we do not. Suppliers are often very quiet about what their plans are going to be, but I promise you that when the day comes and every contract has terms and conditions which allow the parties to exit if they so choose. So that can happen too. And the fifth way that I'm indicating here is the reduced likelihood of receiving preferential treatment. 
And that is the big one, and we'll, we'll get into that. But the other thing I want to bring up, and it's not on here, but Nick brought it up, is that this process creates complexity. When you do things as a customer to me as a supplier, I have to take action generally at some point. I may have to finance my receivable, um, and I have to go to a fintech, and that costs me money, and that takes time. And so I'm adding complexity to the relationship, okay? And that is something that uh, is a big topic today, as Nick pointed out, in supply chain management, complexity management. Uh, next slide, please. So I call this slide, is this, is this the uh, sequence of events, yeah, Carolyn? Yeah, how the sequence of events. Yeah, I call this the circle of life. I mean, you know, look, here's what we want to happen. But keep in mind as I quickly go through this, the reverse can often happen. In our data, whether a supplier likes doing business with a customer, remember suppliers are being surveyed in these studies on behalf of a single customer. And the customer saying, you know, do you want to do business with us? Do you like us? And I have the survey. Um, it's available in PDF if anybody wants it. It's called the Supplier Satisfaction Survey. Very detailed. It will tell you exactly uh, what we think suppliers want from their relationship with the customer. And then they evaluate the customer based on that. We get into all issues of preferential treatment and what they're willing to provide or not. Very, very thorough data set. But one of the things we found was a supplier satisfaction with a customer has no statistical relationship to the length of time of the relationship, the size of the contract, or the size of the supplier. Absolutely no statistical correlation. Everything, cust uh, supplier satisfaction with a customer is totally a function of how satisfied they are with that customer and their performance. And now it can change from supplier to supplier what they want but it's all about performance. So in this sequence, you perform as a customer, and then they say, okay, I'm satisfied with you. If I'm satisfied with you, then I look at you as a preferred customer. In fact, the correlation between satisfaction and preferred customer status is uh, over 0.7, which is very, very high. If you're a preferred customer, I'm willing more likely than not, to give you preferential treatment that other customers can't get, potentially including your, your, your uh, competitors. And by the way, if you get preferential treatment, that may lead to a competitive advantage on your part, customer, and that reduces corporate risk. Now, that all sounds good, but do the flip side of that. You don't perform well as a customer, the suppliers are not satisfied, they don't think you're preferred, they aren't going to give you preferential treatment, you don't get the competitive advantage, in fact, you might get a disadvantage, and you increase corporate risk. It goes both ways. So we're trying to create this sequence of events that we have. Okay, next slide, please. And this was, where do our findings come from that I'm going to show you uh, as we go through a little snippets of data? Uh, Customers, which are buyers, big industrial customers, uh, very few of them want this, to do this, but they should do it. Uh, they come to a third party like us, and they say, can you survey our suppliers? And we work with them to identify the supply base that's the most critical. We don't survey all suppliers, typically one to 200 of the most important suppliers. And then we invite them, and it's all done uh, you know, over a six-week period. And then we analyze the data and then give a, a significant report back to the customer. And I call it the good, the bad, and the ugly. And sometimes it is ugly. I mean, the suppliers, when they're given a chance to give feedback, when they know it's confidential and ethical and secure, uh, they give feedback. Sometimes it, they like the customer. Sometimes they don't. But it's always about a single customer the supplier is focusing on. So it's a supplier satisfaction survey. And if we flip to the next slide, please. This is a table that shows something that's very important. It looks like a lot of data, but I want to make a point. There's actually two studies presented in this table. The one on the left are suppliers evaluating an industrial gas company, like Air Products, Air Liquid, Linde, um, Praxair. And, and, and you know this customer does not buy any raw materials. It's all capital investment items, capital equipment, and services. The company on the right would be like a, a transportation equipment like a Volvo, 
okay, or a Freightliner or Daimler, and they buy components, systems, subsystems, highly engineered items. I picked these two companies to show you because they are completely different on all dimensions, you know, industry, process, everything. The only thing these two customers have in common is they both reside on the planet Earth, okay? That's about it. But look at the top four items. What we do is we have 25 items that we ask suppliers to rate. How important is it for your customer to do these things? These are the top 25. And uh, from the top 25, these are the top four. And I want you to notice that the items on the left, the four items, are the same items on the right. So how can suppliers from different parts of the world, completely different industries, come back and say this is what's most important? And what's interesting is items number five through 25 that they rank order importance, they're not similar between the two uh, supplier segments. But look what they want. They want fair financial return, they want payment in a reasonable time, longer-term business relationships, and they want to see ethical and respectful behavior. So one of the takeaways is that maybe suppliers are not all that different from each other. They are very concerned about the financial aspects of the relationship. Now, think about this for a minute. Even if you knew nothing else from what we're going to go over, you might sit back and say, wow, this is really important to suppliers. I think I'll screw them over on this. You know, I think I'll extend payments. I think I'll take, you know, off the invoice. Won't pay them what, they, what I owe them. And then you wonder why, again, it's a um, kind of a hot button. Uh, you know, it's kind of like the person that kicks a hornet's nest just to kind of see what will happen. Well, I think I can predict. Okay, so next slide, please. But that's only the first part. The second part is we say, okay, how does this customer perform on each of these 25 items? And this is the lowest rated performance items for the transportation, uh, transportation equipment company. I'm dropping the, uh, the industrial gas. They, are, they were loved by suppliers. The data is not as interesting. This is where the interesting data happened to be. And you look at the three areas where the customer performs the worst. Provide a fair financial return, provide payment, reasonable time, offer longer-term business relationships. Guess what? Those were the three most important items to suppliers. So that just doesn't make sense, okay? And so the box should have been dropped down a little again. I apologize. So next slide, please. So now we, now we engage in something called gap analysis. And this is really uh, an interesting technique. We look at the performance of the customer in the eyes of the suppliers, and then we look at the importance of the item, and we take performance minus importance and come up with a gap. And the bigger the negative number, the bigger the ne gap, and the negatives are bad. So the biggest gaps at this company are, all right, provide a fair financial return, and provide payment in a reasonable time. So now you're starting to get a feel that this company has issues on the financial aspects of its relationships with suppliers. Now, you might come back and say, I don't care. I'm going to stretch my payments, and that's good for me. It affects my cash flow, and I don't care if it affects them. The argument of this webinar is that you should care because it's going to cycle back. And that's the problem. It's the cycling back to the customer of the negative effects that you should care about. All right? The problem is we can't measure very well the cycling back of these effects on the customer. You know, what is the effect of a loss of trust or not getting preferential treatment? Or the supplier dropping you as a customer? The accounting systems are not set up for that. But I am set up to measure the improvements to my cash flow as a customer. So next slide, please. Next slide, if I'm the company that got this data, and uh, I'd be scared on this slide. I'd be scared. Because if you take a look, and I, I know it didn't come out how I wanted, but I wanted to circle the values on the items for level of trust. Okay? If you take a look, what I did here, I took one of the items, ability to pay in a reasonable time, and I 
segmented the sample into two groups, one where they're lower satisfied with the customer's ability to pay, one where they're more higher satisfied. And then I compare them. Okay, I compare them. And when I look at this, I say, okay, I'm a little bit concerned. They're less satisfied. They're less likely to view me as preferred. But look at the level of trust, 3.83 versus 6.23 on a seven-point scale. The trust is extremely lower. Now, this is actually predictable because trust is a function of three uh, variables. Ability, can I perform? Integrity, am I honest and ethical? And this is the one that they're falling down on, the customer, benevolence. And benevolence means not taking advantage of the other party when the opportunity presents itself. Well, you are taking advantage of the supplier. The opportunity did present itself, and you took it. And as a result, you are knocking down one of the key dimensions that defines trust in a relationship. Now, if you think trust isn't important, then don't worry about it. But I can show you there's been hundreds of studies done, and almost every one of them concludes trust is the foundation of successful relationships. Look at the bottom one, too. Perception of the type of relationship, 3.72 to 5.15. This is on a continuum that goes 1, 3, 5, 7. Counterproductive to a competitive to a cooperative to collaborative. When you're cooperative or collaborative, which is 5 is, is in that area, that's more of the win-win territory. When you're a 3.7, you're down what we call win-lose. And win-lose is an uh, adversarial model that says I'm going to look out for my self-interest even if it means at the uh, cost of the other party. So the suppliers are saying, we don't have a cooperative relationship. We have an adversarial relationship, a competitive. I'm going to take care of my self-interest, and what happens to you, I don't care. We're going to compete over the value and see what happens. I kind of would like to be on the right side, the win-win side. The reason being, remember, these were this company's most important suppliers to their success. These weren't suppliers that were no big deal. You know, they provide uh, packaging materials that I can get anywhere or, you know, uh, simple components. These were the most critical suppliers. I don't want them thinking half the sample that we are in a win-lose environment because this is where I'm spending probably in this, I think it was about over 85 to 90 percent of this company's total procurement um, expenditures went to these uh, suppliers in this sample. We went out to about 140, 113 uh, participated, which is a good response rate. So next slide, please. So I'd be worried about this. If I'm this company, I'm starting to think, hmm. Oh, by the way, financially, this company's not doing nearly as well as it could be on its return on an assets and other indicators. So it's very possible that they are feeling some financial repercussions. Uh, let's look at it a little different. Let's start talking about preferential treatment. And now I'm going to do correlation analysis. And so what I did is I took supplier satisfaction. Uh, I think that's where we're at, right, uh, Carolyn's correlation between supplier satisfaction. And what I have here is correlation one. Yep, supplier satisfaction. So what it's saying is as suppliers become more satisfied with the customer, these are the highest preferential treatment items they are willing to provide direct financial support, better pricing, hold inventory, more favorable payment terms. Very interesting that all four of these are financially related items out of the 26 preferential items that the suppliers evaluated. Now, remember, suppliers that are least satisfied – oh, I'm sorry, one slide ahead. Lowest rated preferential treatment items um, – oh, you can see what they are, okay, are the financial items. So I'm sorry, I skipped the slide. Go to the next one with correlations. And you will see that the lowest rated items have the highest correlation that suppliers are willing to provide as they increasingly become satisfied with you as a customer. Wow, I think I found the, the, the key to happiness. I think I want to satisfy my suppliers. I want to find out what's important to them. I want to do what I can to make sure I'm looking out for their interests as well, well as my own. And with that, I expect that I should have a better chance 
at financially driven preferential treatment. It sounds almost too good to be true. But this holds up in all the different studies we have done with uh, suppliers looking at a customer. Let's look at the next slide. And that is the uh, fair financial return. That's it. We're now on the right one. Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. Now now what I did is I said, okay, let's look at the um, suppliers that are increasingly happy or not happy with the, fair, the return they're getting, and the correlations even go up a bit, 0 0.53, 0 0.52, 0 0.41, in terms of they are willing to provide to their customer. So I, I guess I'd have to ask, would you want to stand up in front of your executive management and say, why are we not getting these kinds of benefits that we could be getting from suppliers uh, and other companies maybe, and then you explain, well, it's because we unilaterally take actions that kind of are myopic, uh, and I think we're going to feel the effect of that. So you take a look. By the way, if you go back to um, the item, ability to pay in a reasonable time, you don't have to go back, Carolyn, but the correlation between satisfaction and all 26 preferential treatment items, the average correlation is only 0.19. It's not very high. In other words, they're not providing a lot of stuff, but the stuff they are willing to provide, the higher correlations, are really the more meaningful kinds of preferential treatment that we want from the relationship. All right? So that's kind of part of the story. Are, are, you know, are we leaving value on the table? So if we can go to the conclusion slide. And so what does this mean? I mean, obviously, when we, when we publish papers and that we have a lot more in the conclusions. Uh, you know, it's not enough for me to say, uh, here's my conclusion. Don't do it to your suppliers. I, I don't see this train has left the station. I don't see it coming back. Um, although I think if, if there's a company out there that went back to paying their suppliers fairly quickly, I think they would find that the suppliers would be uh, quite grateful and you would be surprised at what they might be willing to do. But I think we know that performing in ways that create supplier dissatisfaction do inc will, should increase corporate risk, and that is not an objective we want. We, hope, we do know that preferred customer status can lead to benefits that are not available necessarily to other companies, some of which may be your competitors. And also that I think customers should recognize how important these financially related items are to their suppliers. You know, I mean, out of those, all the 25 items that we were evaluating in terms of importance to suppliers, and by the way, those items were not just a, a, a figment of imagination. They were done extensively with focus groups, talking to companies and finding out, okay, what do suppliers want from their relationship, you know, with a customer, and then creating that, that kind of a macro listing, if you will. If I'm a customer and I want to extend my payments, I think what I would start to do is I would move from being a unilateral to more of a, a, a cooperative approach, and I would attempt to do what I call offset the effect on the supplier, the financial effect. We know this is going to cost the supplier. We know that, and again, if I send you that PDF article, anybody wants it, it will show you exactly how to calculate the financial impact on the supplier and the amount of margin that is being transferred from the supplier's operating margin to the customer's, okay? And essentially, the supplier is acting as a financial institution for the customer, and that's not the role the supplier's ever wanted to play. So if I'm a customer, I think i got to start thinking about how can I offset or mitigate the impact on the supplier. I could, in fact, um, offer them larger volumes on a longer-term contract you know, that might affect them uh, a positive way on their costs, uh, help to decrease them. And so again, I got to think about that and enter into the discussion because I know if I do it unilaterally, they're going to come. They're probably going to come back at me. If they're not, then I question their 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 um their sophistication. Uh, next slide, please. So I think the bottom line, you know, I think you have to believe that you know as 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 you know, suppliers are satisfied with a customer. Overall, that's a good thing. Although I can show you companies that take pride in how they treat their suppliers poorly. I mean, it is a source of pride. And, and I guess I just think in the long term that is interesting. Um, I'm not saying, you know, give everything away, give them everything they want, but it's to try to understand that there's a mutual 
or, or bilateral uh, uh, meeting of objectives, I hope. So suppliers are increasingly satisfied. They, they, they view you as a preferred customer, and hopefully then you get that very special preferential treatment. I call it your unfair advantage. You want the advantage that others can't have. And with that, that concludes my part. So the last slide is the uh, conclusion. We went over a lot of things uh, quickly, but again, if any materials I have that we can share, absolutely we will. Um, many of you are probably not directly involved day to day with this sort of thing, but it might be a different way to look at what's going on. And I'll end this with a, um, a, a, a two quotes. W one was a, a group of a, a finance people that were doing an analysis for a retailer, and they recommended that the retailer go from a 90-day period payable to a 222-day period for payables. Imagine uh, working in December, not getting paid till next, who knows, uh, July or August, right? Yeah, I don't think you'd appreciate that. And so they asked me to review their presentation, and I and it was very good. You know, you know, a lot of analysis. I said, wait, I said, have you thought about? what the effect on the supplier will be financially, and what the supplier might do to retaliate. And this is the quote I always use that they gave back to me. They said, that is outside the scope of this analysis. And I said, yeah, but what's outside the scope of this analysis might be what really gets you down the line. And the second thing was when I was doing a joint presentation with a, a, a high a, a director of finance at a major core, a global candy company, and this came up, and I said, you know, I see you're doing this. Have you thought about what it's doing to the suppliers? And he looked at me and said, it's all just numbers to me. <laughs> so I guess when you work in finance, it's, it's all just numbers. So that must, be, that must be nice. But in the supply chain, when you're down there in a tactical operational and you're working with suppliers, in the tiers and sub-tiers, it's a different kind of world, and it's not just uh, numbers to them. So keep that in mind. So, again, it's uh, part of the big picture when we talk about risk. With that, I thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bob. Now, <clears throat> finally, um, if you're interested in learning more about supply chain risk management, um, Bob and Nick are both part of the international team that we've pulled together um, to develop a new certificate in supply chain risk management for IRM. And uh, like all our risk qualifications, it's a distance learning course for students around the world, any sector, it's uh, an independent uh, course. And it's they're going to take about six to nine months of part-time distance learning study to complete. And at the end, you get assessed by a multiple choice uh, examination, and you turn up at one of our 5,000 exam centers around the world and, and take this exam. So it's a standalone course. You don't have to be a member of the IRM or have any of other, our other risk qualifications to take it. Although if you've already got an IRM qualification or any other professional qualification for that matter, um, it's going to be excellent CPD to broaden up your competence. So the first examinations for that are going to take place next year, and there's more information about that on our website. So supply chain is a, is a very hot topic for IRM at the moment. And um, we've got, I mean, to take advantage of, uh, you know, we've got two of the world's leading supply chain risk uh, experts here uh, on the webinar. So if anybody has any questions for them, uh, please you know, put them through um, and type them into the box on the, on, on the webinar service. Um, just to sort of kick it off, um, here's, here's a very topical question. Um, so I am concerned about climate change risk to my supply chain. What can I do about that? So, Bob, I'll give you a little bit of a rest from talking and hand over to Nick to say, Nick, climate change and supply chain, you know, what would you like to sort of say about that? Yeah, Carolyn, that, thank you. That's a very topical question. I, I think that comes back, and thank you for that question, um, to my point about understanding and mapping out your critical suppliers, first of all, because if you don't know where they are, you won't know how exposed they are to this climate change. We know that that relates to sea levels, as we know, unfortunately, they are rising, and also particularly adverse weather events, extreme weather events. And there's technology coming along that enables you, once you've mapped them out, to even predict, and maybe it's only 24 hours out or, or so before that significant flood event happens, whether it's from rivers or pluvial flooding, from uh, non-river flooding, as it were. But 24 hours you can achieve quite a lot in 24 hours in terms of actions with your suppliers 
um, in terms of, for, for example, moving out key products out of a warehouse earlier or whatever that might be. So thank you for the question. I hope that answers. Yeah. Bob, would you like to have any observations on, on yeah, the Yeah, that's good. And yeah. in addition, this is what Nick said. You know, I view uh, the climate change as almost coming in as a, a part of the ha uh, hazard risk, you know, putting it there. And, and, you know, and you know, the insurance people, they have all kinds of – they can tell you, you know, if you're going to locate a site, you know, the earthquakes. We, we deal with a little bit more over here. Like we have tornadoes, which you don't get too many of. But, you know, hurricanes, tornadoes, earthquakes. Uh, we get a little bit of all of that. I think we had locusts last year. Who knows? But, um, you know, in, in, so you start to look and say, okay, if I'm going to put a, a, a business here, why don't I do the same thinking and start thinking, well, why would I have a supplier here? And I think you've got to start looking at where those areas uh, are vulnerable and start doing some cluster analysis and other analysis. And, and, and if nothing else, try to uh, mitigate or avoid some of those, those spots. I mean, do you want a you know, supplier that's sitting right on the edge of a, of, a, of a waterway that floods, you know, things of that nature. So I think it's going to come more and more into the hazard risk type category because we're not going to, you know, as a company, we're not going to change single-handedly climate change or climate risk. So we're going to have to think about how do we manage it. And I would treat it like a hazard risk now. Yes, I think it will also have sort of impacts on um, the sort of competing supplies um, as we change, people change their diets. Um, because this is, in the UK, at least, there's a big push towards people becoming vegan, and that's going to put supply, uh, supply issues on things like you know, vegetables. <laughs> so uh, it, it, that will change consumer demand. Um, so I think you mentioned earlier, Nick, about complexity and interconnectedness, and these are themes that come across in a lot of the IRM's work in, in whatever area of risk management you're looking at. And I think supply chain risk is, is going to be more of the same. Yeah. Okay, well, I think we're, we're, we're just about to finish. So um, just to conclude it, I'd like to thank Nick and Bob um, for tuning in today and for sharing their knowledge and experience. Don't forget, you can access a recording of this webinar if you want to hear it again or if you want to um, recommend it to a colleague. And we'll also attach copies of the slides that actually look as they're supposed to look um, to the webinar um, software. And also any other documents that Nick and um, Bob have mentioned today, we'll, we'll load those up as well. Um, take a look at the IRM website for more information about the new certificate and about enrollment. And we've also got a great inquiries team here in London if, if you're more than happy to deal with any inquiries you might have by phone or, or by email. So thank you for everybody for tuning in today. And uh, goodbye, and um, thanks, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Bob? You still there, Bob? No. No, no right.